deliverance. God may paint us into a corner. So we have no other choice but to face, face our fears. Most of us don't care to do that. But it will make us a better person if we are. And we say, well, I don't know if I want to be a better person. Well, whether or not you want, God wants it. He wants you to face your fears as a solution to your tribulation. So that when it's all over, you are, you are stronger than before. There's another example of this. We won't turn there, but you'll recall when the land, children of Israel were asked to enter the land of Canaan, they didn't want to because there were giants in the land. And only two men were able to do what God wanted them to do, which was to go up against the giants as God had asked them to do and fight them. The people did not want to face, face to face, they did not want to come face to face with that which they feared, the giants. Only two men had the, the gumption, the courage, that inner strength to face their fear with God's word behind them and God's promise behind them. For most people, that wasn't enough. They could not face that which they feared. And God will sometimes place us in the position where we are absolutely trapped. We can't retreat anymore. There is no escape. And we must face that fear, that anxiety, that great thing which we loathe and hate and fear. So, that is how God will sometimes create a circumstance in our life, and allow a circumstance in our life to improve us and make us stronger. Now, there is another area. Go with me to the book of Philippians, the New Testament. We'll discover that God wants us to shift our attention from temporal concerns to eternal values. In Philippians chapter 3, allow me to read for you a couple of verses as we look at St. Paul. Now, by the time we're done here, we're going to discover that St. Paul had a great deal of insight into this particular area of life. He was an expert on suffering and sorrow. And Paul says, he he shifts his attention from that which is valuable to him to that which is valuable before God. Now in Philippians 3, he, he describes his own resume, breaking in to verse 5. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of the Hebrews, touching the law of Pharisees, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is the law, blameless. So there's Paul's resume. He had a great deal to be proud of. But then he says, What things were gained to me, these I count lost for Christ. And doubtless I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and to count them the dumb that I might be may win Christ. Now Paul had this enormously wonderful resume that brought great honor to his name and person. And when Paul became a Christian, he was all swept away. And Paul went from being a man admired by many to a man despised by many. And Paul began to see that the great things he took pride in before were no better than a bunch of manure. A pile of manure that he might gain Christ. That he might win Christ. Wow. Wow. Because Paul began to see that things that were of great value in the temporal world, in terms of eternal values, may not be worth all that much. Now back to 1 Peter again. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, helps us understand this shift. This shift from moving our attention from temporal concerns to eternal values. Now he writes in 1 Peter 4, beginning verse 1, for as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he should no longer live the rest of his life in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. Now, God wants us to leave behind the temporal values and embrace the eternal values 
that we might leave behind sin and all of the things that can beset us and lead us in the wrong way to go. Turn with me as we look to consider another reason why God uses suffering and sorrow in a very positive way. It turns out that hardship is the only way that gives us credibility and experience needed to rule with Christ. Hardship. Hardship is required to gain credibility and experience. We're going to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Look with me now at verse number, where is that? Verse number 11. 2 Timothy 2, verse number 11. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. Now look closely at those words again, though. If we be dead with him, we'll live with him. If we suffer, we shall reign with him. Now if we want to rule with Christ, if we want a position in the kingdom of God, where we have a joint rulership in some essence, if he's our captain and we have some area of responsibility, if we want that, we're going to have to suffer. Because it's only through that suffering that we have gained the experience of when we need it, when we need it, and the credibility. Now, this isn't all that much different from the world we live in, is it? You say, I want a leader. Well, that leader needs to have credibility with those he's leading. I mean, if this was an this was an army, and we say we want, we need a leader among us. Who among us would say, I want a leader who has never been to battle? I want a leader who has no experience, who has never suffered the hardship and the challenge of combat. Of course we would not want that. We would say, I put my confidence in a man who has demonstrated in hardship, combat, and battle that he has credibility. Or in anything in life, if we say we want someone to lead us who is a, who, 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 who has a knowledge of writing books, well, we're going to pick someone who's written a book, haven't we? Not someone who is a potential author, but we want someone who is a real author. It doesn't matter what we're talking about. If you want credibility, if we want credibility in the kingdom of heaven, we want to have ten cities or five cities or two cities, we're going to have to prove that now. We're going to have to demonstrate that we can suffer with Christ. That we may rule with Christ. And that suffering is the credibility that's needed to give us that opportunity. We do have another burden. Believers also suffer in conscience. Unbelievers don't have the inner struggle that you and I can trust have. In Romans chapter 7, Paul describes his own internal turmoil. Because we endure the anguish of a wounded conscience. In Romans 7, verse 22, Paul writes in this way. It's a rather famous passage. Paul says, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind, bringing me into the captivity of the law of sin which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Paul is describing this inward anguish and turmoil that adds to the suffering. And how often do we as Christians have a sense of guilt about a given situation? How many times in your life when a given situation of suffering enters into your life and you say, Man, I hope, oh, if only I had done it differently. If only I had been there for person to be If only I had made that one more effort. How many of you ever felt that way? When there's a trial in life, you say, oh man, if I had just done it a little bit differently. Well, that's a good sign that you have that inner anguish. That inner anguish is not bad. It demonstrates that you have a conscience that's working. That you say to yourself, I want to do that which is right and good. And many unbelievers don't have much of a sense of that. They're, they're empty on the inside, and so the inner anguish of guilt is not present. 
But that very inner anguish of guilt not only demonstrates that you're sensitive in your spirit for that which is right, true, and noble, and godly, but it also demonstrates that you're teachable, that you're open, that you are putty in the hands of the master, that you're clay that can be shaped and improved. That you're a piece of metal that God puts back into that fire and heats it up and taps on it with the hammer to slough off the dross and bring forward an improved vessel of greater value than before. There's at least one more reason in the practical world. This is illustrated by, by the following story, the following parable. There was a little bird, a nuthatch. It found a field, and at the edge of the field was a brush pot. The nuthatch began to build a nest. No sooner had the nuthatch finished building its nest in the brush pile than a farmer came along farmer who owned the field, saw the little bird's nest, took a stick and beat on the nest until it broke it apart and it fell on the ground. The nuthatch flew away to a safe distance, looking at the destruction of its nest and said, this is terrible. Why would he do such a thing? What a mean person. What a horrible man. The farmer left. The nuthatch got busy, selected another portion of the brush pile, a little deeper in this time built a new nest. About a week late, wait, later, the farmer comes back, notices that the nuthatch had built a new nest, takes a stick, reaches into the brush pile, and knocks that nest down again. The poor bird escapes and says, this is incredibly unjust and unfair. The farmer leaves, the nuthatch says, well, I'm going to go to the very center at the very safe and remote place here in this brush pile. It's such a good brush pile. And he builds his nest deep in the recesses of the brush pot. About the time he's done, here comes the farmer again. Looks around. Finds that nest. Reaches into the long pole and knocks it all loose. And the nuthatch flies away. Totally frustrated. Finally, the nuthatch said, I guess I'm going to have to build my nest elsewhere. And so he flies away to another distant location. And builds a nest somewhere else. The following day, the bird notices that there is... A lot of smoke coming from that field. Well, the farmer had set that brush pile on fire because he had to clear his field. And the farmer had enough forethought and kindness in his heart to stimulate that nuthatch to do that which it did not want to do. Knowing that had he not chased that nuthatch away, the bird would have been destroyed in the fire in its nest. But now the bird was safe in a distant location. Well, that's very similar to our lives. It could be that tribulation enters our life for future protection and safety. You say, well, okay, well, that's a nice story, but that, that has no real world parallel. That doesn't happen that way in the real life, does it? Actually, it does. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 50. Let me give you a record from the book's of Genesis. In the story of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the children of Israel, that proves to you that this is not just a theoretical concept. Tribulation indeed may be for our protection of future safety. So turn to Genesis chapter 50. As we get to the end of the book of Genesis, and we recall the story of Joseph and his brothers, read this with me. Genesis 50, beginning of verse number 15. When Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us of all the evil which we had done unto him. They sent a messenger to Joseph, saying, My father did command before he died, saying, So shall he say to Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin. For they did unto the evil, and now we pray thee, Forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. They were so fearful of Joseph that Joseph was going to bring forward revenge for the evil they had done. That they brought forward testimony from their dead father. 
They said, don't hurt these guys. <laughs> and his brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, behold, we are thy servants. And Joseph said to them, fear not, for am I in the place of God. But as for you, you thought evil against me. But God meant it good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. And look at verse 20 again closely. Read it again. Ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. Joseph and the wisdom. Now remember, Joseph had wisdom, but do you remember all the sufferings that Joseph had? Oh, he had a lot, didn't he? And how much suffering did he deserve? Not very much. <laughs> a lot of unjust suffering. Joseph had the wisdom to perceive the larger picture. And he understood that God meant it to be that way. That this injustice would happen to Joseph. The cruelty and unkindness that he endured for years, not weeks, not months, years, all added up to salvation for many. It's a very valid thought that God, for our own long-term protection, may stimulate tribulation, suffering, pain, sorrow. We have to trust God. That's not easy to do. That's as our calling. Now, you say, well, all this sounds pretty good, but you really haven't dealt with some of the really heavy issues in terms of suffering and sorrow. Let's look at the final sorrow. All right, let's shift gears and let's look at the the, the greatest and, and most difficult sorrow that we will endure in this life. And that's death. Death. The death of ourself. The death of someone very close to us, a loved one. So let's look at death. I'm not happy to discuss this process to, to, to examine this. But it, I think it would be worth our while. First of all, we must always remember and accept that death is inevitable. <laughs> Hebrews 9, 27 tells us that it is, a, it is appointed unto man once and done. It's appointed. Joshua. In chapter 23, Joshua begins a long speech. At the end of his life, he appears before the children of Israel. And he gives a long speech, a bit of advice. His final words, his farewell address. And in that speech, Joshua wisely reminds them by saying this. He says, I go the way of all the earth. It's a phrase later repeated by David. At the end of his life, King David says to Solomon, Young man, you will soon be king. I go the way of all the earth. All the earth. Everything that's alive dies. Death is literally a part of living. Dying is truly a part of the life cycle process. Dying and death is the last chapter of living. It doesn't matter if it's a plant, or a pet, or you, or me. We all go the way of all the earth. Death is inevitable. We must never forget that. Always remember that death is inevitable. Now, there's more bad news. We neither choose the time, the manner, or the location of our death, or at least the vast, vast majority. Unless you're a terrorist and you decide to blow yourself up or something of that nature, you will not choose the time. You are unlikely to choose the location. You will not choose the circumstances or the manner of your death. Statistically, in America, at present, it breaks down about like this. Less than 5% of us die in our sleep. I had a professor once. I, I really got along with him well. And one day I asked this professor, as we, because I knew him well and we were having a, a little chat, 
I said, do you think you'll ever retire? When are you going to retire? He said, oh, I don't think I'll ever retire. One day they'll just find me slumped over my keyboard here at my desk. Well, that'd be a great blessing to him if that's his passing. 95% of us will not suffer such a passing. 